how's everybody doing? Um, I was telling my co-panel people here today, because I thought we were a plenary session, and I've not really presented to more than 10 or 15 people. So when I heard there was going to be 100, I kind of freaked out. So um, this is OK, though. Everyone looks really friendly. And um, I'm glad you're here. I just wanted to also uh, give a special thanks to the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribal Council for always supporting our programming. Victim Services on the Reservation has always been a priority. And they've always allowed us to uh, fulfill our visions to grow programming and have always been there for us when we've needed them for anything. Um, also for the U.S. Attorney's Office for um, getting funding from OBC to host us here today and to provide training to everybody. Um, and also for everyone who's come and taken time out of your day to be here to hopefully learn a little something new and um, share with us in our successes in our sexual assault response team here on the reservation. And also um, with our programming, I work with crime victims obviously on the reservation here and our programming is sponsored um, in part by Saigon Chippewa Indian Tribe, but also um, our VOCA funding, and actually our funder is here today, which is kind of exciting and scary at the same time. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Um, so, without further ado, uh, my sexual assault response team panel, Detective Sergeant Jason Van Koenig, Brooke Bechtel, she's our sexual assault response lead, and also Shelby McCliggett, therapist with behavioral health programs with Saigon Chippewa Indian Tribe, and our tribal prosecutor, Mr. Graham Leach. So a little bit that we're doing today is we'll each get up here and give you a few slides about what our responsibilities on the team are, where we started, where we came from, writing the protocol, about the laws, um, and then we'll try to get you out of here <coughs> before lunchtime. So we'll go ahead and get started. So obviously, Sexual Assault Response Team, I would hope that everyone in this room would know what that is at this point. If you don't, that's okay. Um, obviously, it's a, a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional team that provides coordinated investigations for victims of sexual assault here in Indian Country. We really pride ourselves in what we do. We've taken a long time to get to this point. We started our team back in 2012 with just having meetings and protocol writing and it's been a work in progress. I mean, obviously things had to go to the legal department and um, a resolution was made by tribal council to have our team um, be signed into law, basically, with the tribe. But a key responsibility of our team is obviously to reduce trauma for our victims because those people that will come in to tell us their stories really mean a lot to us. And I don't want to traumatize them further by having four different agencies having to contact them to get information. So typically, it would go through one of the advocates in our office and law enforcement obviously is involved, the therapist, and but we really try to keep the team just small and tight just to make sure that the victim's needs are fulfilled. So obviously any members of your team would hopefully have state-of-the-art investigation techniques and that's been something that we've been able to do through funding um, with our CTAS grant, but also that your advocacy efforts and the treatment strategies for victims should be in place as well for trauma. A big part of our team has also been our Sexual Assault Forensic Nurse Examiners Program. And anyone that doesn't know what that is, obviously, that's a, a big part of our case. And I was kind of talking um, to some people last night about the CSI shows like Forensic Files, which is something I watch every night before I go to bed because I'm obsessed. But it's kind of um, ruined sexual assault cases for jurors because they feel like they need evidence. There has to be some kind of biological sample of something to prove a case, that there's always DNA, which that's hardly ever the case. But in the instance that there was, these fine people, our RNs that um, work at McLaren Hospital, are members of our team, obviously, and they would collect evidence. Um, they go through a 40-hour training. They are also trained to be able to testify in court and work very closely with our team if need be. So they would be the ones to call us out, call our law enforcement out, um, and offer um, treatment to victims as well, drug testing, STI, STD testing, things like that. So the purpose of a coordinated response obviously reduce trauma to victims. That's why we do what we do. It 
doesn't make any sense for a victim to have to meet with me, to meet with Graham, to meet with Jason, and then, you know, follow up with Shelby at another time. That just, it doesn't make sense. And it's, if they can meet with us all at once, or if I could introduce them to someone, I think people are a lot more comfortable getting services, because when they come to someone they trust, then they're more likely to say, okay, well, Mandy likes her, so she's probably a good person. So yeah, I'll go see her. Also, because of the reinstatement of our same programming in Isabella County, it was um, a few years ago, we had lost all of our funding, and it was a grant through the state of Michigan. And forensic nursing is such a big part of what we do that we kind of got together as a team and just said, okay, what do we need? How can we move forward without the same programming? So back in 2012, we got together, and luckily the CTAS grant was coming out. I don't know if anyone knows what CTAS is. It's a coordinated tribal assistance grant that's um, available to all tribes in the nation. So we wanted to apply for funding, so we got together with law enforcement, FBI, prosecutors, advocates, um, some of our shelter staff to figure out what do we want to spend this money on. So part of that money was Brooke's position and thankfully, we need we needed a sexual assault response lead because that person has to be able to take care of the ins and outs of meetings and case notes and making sure the same programming is up and running. She was a really big instrumental part of getting that done. But we all got together and decided, well, what else would we want out of this money? We could ask for anything. So then we got a therapist. So that's where the funding dollars came for Shelby to be able to provide therapy for sexual assault and domestic violence victims on the reservation. And also, let's be honest, we're not perfect and we need training. We always need training. I think um, it's been, and forgive me for saying this, Jason, the law enforcement in the room, and I was just talking to Gary about it earlier, but you guys are a tough crowd. <laughs> you guys are really, and I don't know what it is, it's this club that I just can't get in. I mean, I feel like I'm in it now, but it's just a group, a group of people that, if you don't have a badge and a gun, they're like, oh, please wait at the door. Yeah. So, but over the years, we have fostered a really great relationship with law enforcement. And I remember the time that Jason had come to me because he couldn't get a hold of one of our victims. And he came to me and said, I need you to do something for me. And I was like, yes, you need me. I know you need me. I told you you need me. So this was years ago. And so our relationship since then has been really great. And luckily, we're in the same building as law enforcement. So they're able to just come knock on the door. I mean, they obviously have our cell phone numbers and call if they ever need anything. But it's always for the victims. <coughs> and lastly, for justice. And Sarah talked about earlier what justice looks like for people. And it can look different um, for everybody. But for us, I think, and I have a clip from a victim that she wanted me to share with you guys today, which is really awesome. Um, so she can tell you in her own words. But also the statistics that Sarah provided earlier are so dead on. And I remember talking with our group about or other people that work in Indian country with sexual assault victims, it's like, man, it just seems like one in three, that's not right. It's, it's a lot more than that. I actually don't know any of my victims that haven't been assaulted in some way, shape, or form, and now I think I've been in the field so long, I'm starting to work with their kids, and I'm starting to see grandkids coming in, and it's just, it's really devastating, so we're trying to break that cycle by getting people justice. So the role of victim advocacy, you guys know what this stuff is. Support people, believe people. You can't have victims programming where your turnover rate is extremely high. I've been doing this work, this is my 14th year, and trust is so important in Indian country. And anywhere you go, you want to have staff that someone says, oh my gosh, I saw you, I know you, my mom knows you, my auntie knows you, my grandma's talked to you before. That's, I think, the reason we've had so much, so much success in our program is because we've been around for so long. People are just really comfortable coming to our doors. Building trust obviously takes time. Um, something that we kind of pride ourselves in um, 
is that the, we really take care of our victims. I give victims my personal phone number, which a lot of therapists would say you have boundary issues. But their text messages, you know, if they need to talk, I'm there for them. Um, send them greeting cards, I'm thinking about you. Sometimes, um, especially if kids come in, we get pizza. Remember Janet? We got pizza once and we had lunch with the girls and just spending time with people. It just says that you care and that you want to help. Just because cases aren't prosecuted, it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. So no matter what happens in our cases, I think the effort, it really means something to people because there's going to be times that there's not enough information to go forward for our U.S. Attorney's Office or for Graham. There's just not enough. But that doesn't mean that we can't try. It's the effort that you put in that people take away. So I'll play you our little clip here um, and let her tell you herself how she feels about what we do. I can't do this. 
you know, I can't do this by myself. I'm not strong. But with talking with you guys, I got my strength back. I built myself back up. And I did that.
And survivors are never pressured to cooperate with any phase or work with our team at all for that matter, but we certainly aim to ensure that a survivor understands all of their options so they can make the best possible decision for themselves. This concept of giving the survivor the power is crucial to being victim-centered, and that language is clearly outlined throughout our protocol. As our team was developing, our protocol served as a working document that we frequently modified. But however, to ensure sustainability of the team, we sent our protocol to our legal department and then to tribal council for approval. And sustainability is a prime focus, and having something in writing gave us the confidence that this team would be sustainable long after the grant ended. Having our tribal leaders back our goal and our mission really gave us that confidence that they saw the need for it and it really made us confident that this work will last long after this grant period ends. So amongst improving our response, our team has influenced many other improvements in the community. From the beginning we knew that we were missing the medical forensic piece. Um, how do you have a truly comprehensive start without a SANE program? So we had to refer victims to other programs throughout the state, um, which not only was that a huge disservice to victims, but they had, because they had to explain their story to yet another agency and yet another advocate there in the press, but it was also a referral to us that distanced them from our team. So it was a challenge that from the get-go, we've had a prime focus of fixing that and bringing that much-needed service back to our community. So to address the gap, members of our team began meeting with other community organizations, and essentially we formed a subgroup that was committed to restoring SANE. And after exploring multiple options, uh, we ended up sending a request to the federal government that actually funds our SART team and asking to reallocate some of the funds that we already had. So essentially we changed the scope of the grant to support a SANE program. And that allowed us to cover the startup costs of the training, which as Mandy had mentioned, the nurses go through a 40 hour online training and then they come on site to do clinicals and the mock trial training. So there's a pretty significant cost to that. And we initially had 12 nurses from our emergency room that were interested in becoming trained. So we worked for approximately two years. We started in August of 2014 I'm working on this project to locate funding, obtain the support, train the staff, and the goal was finally achieved in June of this year. We now have an identified private room within our local hospital that's dedicated to providing SANE services. Our SANE program operates what is called an advocate-initiated response, which essentially means that the, the victim advocate, the law enforcement officer, and the nurse all respond when an assault is reported. And though we focus on having the victim, it's certainly their choice whether they want to be involved with all of those people, but it's important that we all respond in the beginning and then let them make that choice after we're all there. Because if you ask someone, would you like me to call an advocate? If it's two in the morning, they're not gonna want you to bother, but the truth of the matter is, if that person's there, it not only will help them build confidence and trust with you, but then it eases, like Mandy said, when you say there's these other great people here to help you. And you can explain what those options are and allow them to make an informed choice. And it's important at that time, too, to explain that you don't have to decide right now. We'll be here a year from now if you need us. So that responding immediately or as soon as possible with the whole team is really important. To meet some of the other needs in our community, we've led some other projects too, such as training. Um, we were able to provide training through the grant, and the training topics are chosen by doing a needs assessment. Um, we primarily focus on the tribal law enforcement because that's where the grant was written. Um, but we provided an anonymous needs assessment and had all the law enforcement officers complete that to assess areas of need and interest, and then we based the topics off of that. So last year our training focused on the neurobiology of trauma strangulation and trauma-informed investigations. And this year we're working to focus, we haven't set our dates or anything yet, but we're looking to do something with evidence photography, because that seems to be a challenge with some of our cases, getting <coughs> pictures that will really help, because at the end of the day you have to be able to convince a jury that this happened and you need some of that concrete evidence. We've also implemented some special projects that are more key to just focusing on what the survivor may need. And we've I'd like to briefly share two. There's lots I could go on for a long time, but I'd like to briefly share two. The first being, um, we've created Moving Beyond Bags, is what we call them. These contain personal care items such as clothing, undergarments, a washcloth, a journal, victims' rights, compensation information, a journal. We have cultural medicines in there. The purpose is just to provide a survivor with anything that they might need to bring them a little bit of comfort in the event of an assault, an immediate assault. So if you're at the hospital and they have to collect your clothing as evidence, we don't want you sent home in hospital gown or something that's yours and hopefully can provide comfort in that very unfortunate situation. 
So we created these beds for both males and females, because males are certainly assaulted too. And those are available here in our community at all the law enforcement agencies, our hospital same program, as well as our advocacy centers. Trauma-informed interviews was another need that kept, when you're listening to victims, it kept, sometimes I felt re-victimized, or I felt like maybe that was an area that we could work to improve. So aside from the training, we also worked with Roy Krantz, who I'm sure a lot of you know, um, and he helped us, we were just talking to Roy, if you were to prosecute a case, what are all the things that you would need? What kinds of information would you need? So he wrote us a list, and then we transformed those questions into, just wrote them in a trauma-informed way, and published guidance <coughs> called for sexual assault, domestic violence, and strangulation. So just if you get in that binder, if you're perhaps new officers, or someone who maybe just needs a refresher, or what do I need to ask? Just reference that guide really quick. And we provided those to the local law enforcement here in Isabella County, as well as all the tribes in Michigan were offered those as well. So these ideas for these special projects, they come directly from survivors, like the one that you had heard from. It's really important to spend the time with them and listen and help them understand what they need, because at the end of the day, if we're meeting their needs, we're also meeting our team's needs, and we're doing our jobs appropriately when we can look at ourselves in that way and kind of pull the mirror up and look and say, where can we do better here by these people? Um, so before I turn it over to Shelby, I might just want you to know that we've provided flash drives that have our protocol on it. Oh, I don't want to print it, it's a very long and detailed document, but for everyone who's interested in perhaps modifying it to make it your own, it's available on the resource table when you first walk in, and it's a blue flash drive. And you can find our team's protocol on there, so feel free to take it back to your communities, use it as your own. Um, there's no reason to recreate the wheel. If it's something that could work for you, please do so. And if I had one word of advice for starting it, it's just find people who are as passionate as you are. It makes it so easy when your team is just as committed to making a difference as you are. It makes these things very simpler, because it can seem like, how do you start a summer team? That's kind of where I was at. But when you meet together and you realize you all have a common goal, it's not as daunting as it may sound. So without further ado, we'll have Shelby come up. that I present to you because there is no common way that trauma presents itself. Um, it's an emotional shock following a deeply distressing or disturbing experience which overwhelms people's abilities to cope and it leaves them powerless. So it's thinking about car accidents you may have been in or you may have seen. You may not feel or think that it's traumatized you, but it's secondary trauma. So whether that be you get a little more nervous the next time you get in the car, but you don't know why. It's because of the accident that you saw maybe six months ago, or a day ago, or a year ago, or it's the color of the car. Because little things can trigger people, whether that be a sight, a smell, a sound, somebody's tone of voice, um, the way somebody moves their hair. It's just these little things that we never think about because we didn't go through the experience. And so as human beings, our bodies are programmed to take that traumatic experience and encode it. And when they encode it, it goes to multiple different places in your brain. And the best way it's ever been described to me was by Russell Strand, who came here and did a training in October. And it was a little unique in that he had a puzzle, a box full of puzzle pieces. And he kind of just tossed it in the air, and pieces flew out, and then he closed the box and threw the box. And we're all kind of sitting there like, what's happening? And he explained it in a way that my clients are actually able to visualize and 
they can understand it, and that some of the pieces land face up, and those are the memories that are there. The, you know, it be the color of the shirt, the smells, the sounds, whatever, and some are upside down. And those memories may come a month later, three months later, a year later, like Brooke had mentioned. And some are in the corner, in the box, and they'll never come out. So a, or a victim or a client may come to you and say, you know, one day that the shirt was blue on their perpetrator. And then the next day it's purple. And it's not that they're lying to you or they made it up or they are just trying to get somebody prosecuted for it. It's just they honestly are remembering things slowly as things sit with them longer. And when they come to me, I'm able to sit with them and have them talk about a trauma narrative. And that's just telling their story. And it's getting them to a point where they have told the story so many times that it is congruent. There are no more gaps. There may be pieces that never come up but it at least is cohesive enough that it starts to make sense to the investigators. Because that's probably the most frustrating part for them is there's so many different pieces and how do they put it together because they don't have the time. They don't have the time to put it together. So the more effective the client can be when they go to them with their story, the more productive they can be in helping the victim. Um, so different things that you can see like effects in terms of how the client's behavior may be. They may be hypersensitive to things, they may be disassociative, um, defensive, they may have a lot of guilt, embarrassment, and they might also have some risky behaviors. So this would be acting out sexually, um, which may startle some people and say, well, why would they do that? But it's just their trauma response. There's no rhyme or reason. Um, some, also, some helpful tips to remember when working with clients is that it's important to give them a lot of care, which is what our team does. We kind of surround them. There's me. Mandy is always calling them. <laughs> she calls them more than I do and probably sees them more than I do, which is a good thing because my caseload is large and I don't have the time. So the fact that they can pick up the pieces where I can't is extremely helpful. Um, you also want to make sure that you meet the client where they are because we may want them to come in and just tell the entire story, but they may not be able to. So our expectations have to meet their expectations. We can't force them into anything they don't want. Um, remember to be empathetic. Remember to be compassionate. Remember to be respectful, because if you're not respectful to them, they're not gonna give you anything. Um, also with the speech, be very mindful of the tone the pace, um, how is the message being received to them? So even asking them, how did you hear that? Or tell me what you heard me say, just to make sure that they're checking in with you and that they're actually hearing you. <coughs> Most importantly, believe them. Even if you have the slightest inkling that, oh, something's not sounding right, just believe them. Because you might be the only person at that moment that does. And then the last thing is educating them on trauma whether that be giving them resources of counselors, advocates. Make sure you ask them, do you want me to give them your information? Do you want to call them yourself? Do you want me to call them with you? And give them that option, because a lot of times they don't have options. They feel like they're just stuck. Also remind them that they're not alone, because I've had a lot of clients who will sit there and they will tell me nobody else feels this way, nobody's gonna understand what I'm talking about. And so even having like helpful resources in letting them know you're not alone, you're not the only person who's ever experienced this, and just reminding them that you're there to help them and that what they're feeling is okay and that there's people willing to help them with that. Um, so that's really all I have. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to um, the tribal prosecutor, Graham Leach, and he's going to talk about the legal aspects. Good morning, I guess it is so morning. One of the things I wanted to talk about as a prosecutor is how the SART team has really affected the way I do my job and I've and affected how I can be more effective at my job. One of the things as a prosecutor getting super excited about when I got involved in this team is 
one of the first things you hear is, this is evidence-based. As a prosecutor, I'm like, this is fantastic. We can, you know, I love evidence, I need evidence, and, and we can then go forward with evidence and that helps with prosecution. Um, the fact that we have people responding when a, a crime occurs to the hospital, be it the, there's a representative of the SAR team there as well as the police, and they have that evidence focus to what they're doing. And this is certainly helpful in a lot of ways. Evidence can be collected immediately, examinations can be done. Obviously, as has been said throughout, that if that's not what the victim wants, certainly we're not forcing that. But the fact that we start that process early can only help us as we move forward. In the same program is certainly a big part of that as well. But one of the things I think about, there are often times when the victim is in that initial state of trauma and they're at the hospital and all of this is going on and, and they don't want to pursue this. They don't want to, at that moment, they don't want to go through with the prosecution. They want to seek their justice in a different way. But we are still there to support them. We're still there where we can collect some of that evidence and we can preserve some of that evidence when six months, a year, 10 years down the road, they change their mind. They work through their trauma with the help of the team, with the help of Shelby and others. We have that basis to move forward with prosecution if that's where the justice needs to happen. If it doesn't, that's okay too. They can seek their justice in other ways. But that the other thing that that first initial evidence collection really helps with is sometimes, even when we've charged a case, I've charged a case and we're, we're proceeding to trial, the more evidence I have, the more thorough the investigation, the more complete this team has moved forward, frankly, we're less likely to go to trial. We're likely to get a plea if we can present the case to the defense and the defendant and show them that we have all of our ducks in a row. We have all of the pieces to the prosecution puzzle, at least. And at that point, we can start talking about a plea of some sort that balances the needs of the, of the victim, the needs of the survivor, as well as the needs of society and the needs of prosecution. It balances punishment with stopping recidivism, with deterrence and all of the other things that we seek as prosecutors. So this team has been fantastic in that evidence-based arena. And that was my first thought as a, as a prosecutor when I, when I joined the team. But the other two points that I have up there have almost become more important to me and made me a more effective prosecutor. And, and those I'm going to talk about a little bit together. But the fact that this is a, a victim-centered program and has multiple viewpoints, by keeping the victim the focus throughout the process, the process through the initial reporting and investigation and prosecution and up and through sentencing, we again can balance that goals of prosecution as well as the needs in, of the survivor. Sometimes a survivor needs a day in court and the opportunity to face their attacker. And others don't and they can't. And sometimes as prosecutors we tend to focus, and I, I think Barb mentioned this too, that sometimes we get a little too focused on a conviction and we get too focused on a sentence and can lose, not lose sight, but sometimes get a little too focused on that. And by having this victim-centered approach and these, these repeated meetings with the team that we have, and they can keep me informed and keep the police informed on what the victim is going through, what they're thinking about, where they're at as far as what they would like to see happen and what they're capable of doing. We can get justice in, in many, many different ways. And it doesn't have to be through a conviction and a sentence, but certainly uh, it can be in other ways. I, as a prosecutor, want the conviction and the sentence, but I've learned that sometimes that's not the outcome that's best for everybody involved. And sort of to piggyback along with that, the multiple viewpoints, it's essential for an effective prosecution and an effective investigation that I can sit and I've learned that as I can sit and talk to therapists 
and I can sit and talk to victims advocates who have a different perspective on where we should go and how assaults and sexual assaults and domestic violences can be prosecuted with success and justice can be had with success that doesn't always result in a conviction and those type of things. So as we do these meetings and I pr proceed through my part of my role in through offering a plea or preparing for trial, having the viewpoints of everybody else as we meet, often monthly as we get closer to trial, sometimes more. I talk to, to Mandy every day. Um, that perspective certainly is one more thing that I think has really helped me become a pro better prosecutor, helped our community do a better job of prosecuting and helped our community, do more, most importantly probably, do a better job of healing and, and serving that victim. And I think I've worked places where there, prior to a sexual assault response team being in place, and I can't say enough good things about how much more effective I feel like we are here than I've been in some other places that I've worked. And that's sort of what I wanted to talk about as far as how the SART team actually helps in a prosecution. The other thing that we don't always think about is that the SART team and the passion of these people in our working together has made some changes that have benefited our tribal community beyond just a direct helping of an individual victim with their individual case or the larger picture. Um, when I, prior to the sexual assault team being in place, uh, the tribal code here on the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Reservation had um, two, only two code sections that address sexual assault in any way. Um, a general rape statute and then an indecent liberties with a child. Um, this one size fits all box of of prosecuting a, a sexual assault case certainly wasn't as effective as it could be and this change went hand in hand as we developed our SART team. We now have eight different sexual assault crimes and these have come into being in right around 2013 which is where we really got involved with the SART team and while not solely the work of the SART team, it was the work of, of many people and many agencies throughout the tribal community. I think this shows how much more effective we've become in addressing the individual crimes as they occur and as they happen. The other thing that this, uh, these changes did, uh, it brought us into compliance with the uh, changes in the sex offender registry law, which I think is incredibly important. But these things happened not directly, but as an ancillary benefit to having a sexual assault response team, and I truly believe that. One of the other things we're working on is with the statute of limitations. Uh, the statute of limitations currently uh, here is one year from the date of crime. Um, we've learned, and, and Shelby has talked about particularly, that sometimes it's weeks, months, days, years before someone is ready to uh, disclose that they've been assaulted or uh, ready to report that or ready to move forward. And as a prosecutor, there have been few tougher conversations I've had than having someone, having to explain to someone that, yes, I believe you, yes, this happened to you, and I'm sorry I can't help you get the justice you need for those people who need justice through the court system. So what we have presented to tribal council, um, the sexual assault team particularly has been incredibly helpful in providing me with research about displays, delayed disclosure in children and as well as adults. And we presented to tribal council and I think we are very close to having this uh, completed that it's gonna be, what I'm hoping for is that we'll have a statute of limitations that um, is some period of years after disclosure to a mandatory reporter. And I think that is something that is gonna expand the scope of our ability to really help victims seek what they need, help the prosecution seek, get what they need, and all of this, I think the changes in the law, particularly this one, is something that can be directly attributed to the passion and 
and dedication of the people on this team. So I'm certainly proud to be a part of it. And I will now let uh, Detective Sergeant Van Conant go through a case study of one of the cases that we prosecuted here <laughs> on, on the site on Chippewa Reservation. Thank you. Good morning. As Graham said, uh, I'm Detective Sergeant Jason Van Conant. I work here for the uh, Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe, work for the Tribal Police here. I've been here for almost 18 years and uh, work closely with uh, AUSA Roy Kranz, who I was hoping would be here today, but uh, fortunate for you guys, uh, last week or before lunch, that you have me and not him, because he likes to talk more than I do. Um, but uh, thank you, Barb, for Roy, because uh, he's been instrumental in our prosecution of our sexual assault cases in Indian country, and he has been uh, relentless at, uh, at getting justice for victims. So we appreciate it. Um, today I'm going to go through a case study. Um, the names of the suspects and the victims have been omitted to protect identity. Um, some of you local people may figure it out, but um, we wanted to just give you the facts of the case. Um, and the effects that uh, these acts have had on the victims of these crimes. Um, also want to, uh, to get across the need for the SART team and the benefits the, teams had on the, the team has had on victims of crime and their critical role in um, the sexual assault cases. So this is our case study. Um, this is a recent study from uh, 2015. Um, the case involves a 45-year-old male suspect. And the case has uh, not yet been sentenced. So I'm here today to talk to you about this case. Um, it was reported to the Tribal Police Department in May of 2015 uh, through what we have as a centralized intake, uh, which is our Department of Human Services uh, out of Grand Rapids. Um, so what they do is basically uh, they get intakes from referrals from all over the state uh, when people report uh, crimes that to different people, whether it be law enforcement or counselors or uh, people of mandatory reporting. They were all report to one centralized intake. Then the centralized intake gets the information to the local law enforcement agency that it needs to go to. So here we have a 24-year-old uh, female that reports to her therapist that she was molested uh, by a stepfather when she was between 12 and 13 years of, old, of age, uh, back in when she was in sixth or seventh grade. Um, so at the time, there were young teenage uh, children living in a home uh, with a suspect at the time that the crime was reported to the therapist, and so she felt the need for, for that crime to be reported to law enforcement, so she made a referral. So again, uh, the disclosure came out during the therapy session with the victim, uh, the victim's mother, and then the victim's sister. Um, the mother had taken the children to therapy because uh, there was some issues with depression and, and cutting and other behavioral issues. So she was trying to get help for her daughters. So rewind a little bit. Um, the story came out uh, much later than the incident happened. Um, October 2010, at 18 years of age, our victim disclosed to her mother about being uh, sexually assaulted as a child uh, by her stepfather. Um, victim reports that the, uh, the suspect had uh, touched her breast and vagina over her clothing numerous times, and also that the suspect had digitally penetrated her. There was also sexual gratification by the suspect um, through control of the victim. So in uh, 2010, when it was reported to the mother of our victim, uh, the victim did not want the incident reported to the police. Um, the victim's mother, uh, although she was very angry and upset, she wanted to respect the wishes of her daughter. She, the, our victim did not want uh, her, her siblings to grow up without a father, and she didn't want anybody to be mad at her. 
uh, for reporting the abuse and breaking up the family. Um, uh, she was experiencing some guilt from that, which many of our victims do. Um, and so that's, that's where it landed. Um, also at the time, domestic violence was reported happening in the home. Um, the suspect was physically, mentally, and verbally abusive to his wife and the children. So, um, Shelby and Brooke have talked about um, some victim effects here, just a few more that are particular to our case here. Um, victim was uh, suicidal at times. She felt that her family would be uh, better off without her. Um, she was extremely depressed. Um, she expressed difficult time having normal relationships with uh, men. Um, and she had uh, reported extreme anxiety um, in any environment, even in a workplace setting. She just, she, she lacked a, a trust of men after all this, uh, the sexual abuse that happened to her. So our victim reports uh, that her mother had actually walked in the room um, when the suspect was touching her back when she was a child. And the suspect had claimed that uh, the victim was having a nightmare. She was having a bad dream. And of course the mother believed it at the time, um, which is what a parent should do for a child, um, and to comfort them. That's not what was happening at all. The bad dream was a living nightmare for a victim, and it took her more than 10 years to wake up from and finally come forward and report the crime that had been committed against her. So when the victim had disclosed to her mother the sexual abuse, as you can imagine, her mother was uh, extremely upset. Um, so she calls this family meeting. And uh, well, first, she, she first confronts the suspect, and he admits it. He admits, he admits that he's been inappropriate with his stepdaughter. And uh, so then, mother calls a family meeting, and she makes him tell the rest of the family what he'd done. Um, he said, you know, he would turn himself in if that's what the family wanted him to do. Um, at the time, they decided that wasn't the right thing to do at the time; that they were going to deal with it themselves. It later, turned out that it worked. So again, her suspect was uh, reported by many people to be a man's man. They, he shouldered the brunt of a confrontation, that he never cried, never showed emotion. At the time of his confession, he was on his knees and crying, begging his family to forgive him. This was reported by everyone there at this meeting. Um, so five years would pass family trying to deal with the trauma that has been uh, inflicted on our victim. And uh, so five years passes and the abuse finally gets reported through therapy. So at this point, five years has passed and our suspect thinks it's, he's getting away with this. Um, so the mother of our victim uh, tries to do a recorded phone call to our suspect in 2015, an attempt to reiterate what he had confessed five years earlier to doing to his stepdaughter. So during this recorded call, our suspect uh, minimized uh, his involvement in what he did, uh, denied that he ever had sex with her, which remained true. All of his uh, sexual abuse was sexual acts and not actual penis vaginal sex. Um, and he also said he never touched the victim like she said. So some of the things he did admit, he admitted to kissing the victim. Um, and he says that he confessed five years earlier because he just wanted to, quote, get it over with. I don't know if anyone in this room would confess to sexual abuse of a child just to get it over with if it hadn't actually happened. So at the end of the conversation, he admits to being a bad father. Well, of course he was. So the suspect was interviewed 
in June of 2015, um, here comes the denials. He denies domestic violence in the home. He denies inappropriate touching with any of the children. He denies that this confession, this family meeting that he confessed to his wife and all of his children, um, he denies that ever happened. Um, we offer him, our officer offers him a polygraph uh, on the case and he declines it, of course. Uh, at the time, he served with the personal protection order protecting the victim and her mother. This is something we always look for in child sexual abuse cases, especially when the reporting is delayed. Um, it's very powerful to tell a jury that our victim actually told someone when she was, when the abuse was happening to her back in seventh grade. Um, she had a childhood friend that she confided, confided in and uh, she told her that this abuse was happening but she swore her friend to secrecy. And uh, that's the classic thing that we're always looking for but we hardly ever find. And uh, we had it in this case and we had it multiple times in this case. Um, so that was very powerful to take to a jury because uh, AUSA Grants and I, uh, we always try to figure out what the defense is going to be in a case. And uh, we figured that this one, there was a divorce, obviously it's coming up. Um, so we, we figured that the defense would be that, that victims are making all this up um, just to get back at the suspect or to get you know rights to the other children. Um, so it's pretty hard for the defense to say that they're making this up when the abuse was disclosed to friends you know, 10 years prior. Um, so the friend, uh, honors the request of, of the victim to not tell anyone. And so she carries that inside of her also. She can't help her friend, I'm sure she wanted to. So, the childhood friend disclosure. So after the, uh, after the victims come, the victim comes forward to the police and she gives her statement and we ask her these questions about, did you ever tell anyone back then? Or did you ever tell anyone prior to you telling us right now? And, she disclosed that she had, she had told her friend back, back in the uh, seventh grade. So, um, but she told us, you know, that she told her friend not to tell anyone. So um, we had her set that back up with the friend, saying, "Hey, can you call her and tell her that you know it's okay to talk to us now about it?" And so she she did that, and the friend came in. She gave her statement as to what the victim told her years ago, and uh, then she eventually testified at trial. She was a very powerful witness. So, a divorce, I mentioned uh, it was coming out, here it is, uh, June of 2015. Um, the suspect then gave up uh, full custody of his remaining minor children. There were two additional children in the home still that were minors, and uh, he gave up full custody of those. So, during our sexual assault interviews, uh, we often look for other victims because it's been our experience that uh, when there's one victim, there's probably more victims. And uh, so we try to, to filter out and figure out who this person has been around, what kind, of, uh, what kind of contact he's had with children over the years since this abuse has happened. And uh, through family members and our other victims, we found that there were uh, two other Two other victims in the case. Um, when I skipped the, uh, the two minor children, um, one of the reasons that the minor children were were being taken into uh, therapy was because uh, they were experiencing depression, and one of them actually was cutting, uh, which are classic signs of sexual abuse <coughs> in our field. And so. They were forensically interviewed. Be the next slide. Okay, so two additional child victims that were now adults were located and interviewed. Um, these one of the uh, one of the victims actually disclosed that way back in 1988 she had been sexually assaulted by her suspect. So both additional victims uh, disclosed abuse by the suspect when they were between 9 and 15 years old. Uh, one of the victims said that she was touched by the suspect just after her ninth birthday, 
back in 1988, and she remembered that vividly, um, even though it was many years later. So this victim says that there are two more victims, but she was respecting their wishes uh, to not come forward. Uh, they just they weren't ready, and we didn't we didn't push the issue on that. We already had three victims in this case, and uh, so those those two victims are still out there. So um, we took all of our all of our information, all of our interviews and all of our witnesses and we put it in front of the grand jury and uh, what happened after that was in in 2015 the grand jury indicted our suspect on nine counts of various sexual assaults so plea offers and this may look a little tainted but uh the AUSA offered our suspect an initial plea agreement of 121 to 151 months, which equates to uh, 10 to 12 and a half years in prison. This was initially declined by the suspect, so um, AUSA Kranz uh, had looked at the numbers again and he realized that he did not uh, score him as a repeat and dangerous uh, sex offender, um, which should have been done. So he reworked the numbers and uh, and this was what they came up with as a plea. Um, that was the bottom part of this the guideline, 17 and a half to 21 and a half years. This officer, offer was uh, declined by the suspect again. So the case went to trial. This is, this is a recent case. It hit, there's been no sentencing yet. Uh, went to fi trial in federal court June 21st, uh, 2016. Uh, lasted just three days. The prosecution uh, called 11 witnesses that testified to either sexual abuse by the suspect or witnesses to a disclosure of sexual abuse, the people that these victims told. We had an expert witness that testified uh, to the effects of domestic violence and victims of sexual assault behaviors, um, why a particular victim would behave in a certain way, um, why they would act in a certain way, what's typical of a victim, um, and many of the things that the expert talked about are our victims were displaying those types of behavior, so it's really powerful for the jury. So during the trial, our, uh, our defendant, our suspect, was going, to, uh, was going to testify, it was his intention to testify on his own behalf, um, right up until it was time to get on the stand. And then uh, at the last minute, he backed out. And his attorney was trying to talk about it the whole time. Um, so once the, uh, the prosecution and defense rested, uh, it took the jury only two hours to reach a verdict. Um, the jury came back uh, guilty on all eight counts of sexually assaulting minor children. So the sentencing in this case is scheduled uh, for in September of this year in the United States uh, District Court in Bay City. Um, this is one of our one of our most powerful cases. Um, it was a tough case for for me to work and for the team to work, but um, with the dozens of people that were involved in the case, uh, including, as I said, uh, AUSA Roy Kranz, um, we were able to be successful in this case and get justice for the victims. Um, so after the, uh, the verdict by the jury, uh, Roy likes to listen in on jail calls, which we have access to. And, um, our suspect or our, our defendant uh, never took any responsibility for his actions, um, even though he did in 2010 to his family. Um, he's maintained his innocence uh, even after being convicted by a jury. And so this is... Uh, Oh yeah, okay, sentencing guidelines first. Um, after trial, he should have took the deal. I think you remember it was 17 to 21 years. Um, now he's, uh, his guidelines are life in prison. So this is his quote from the jail call uh, about not taking any responsibilities for his actions, for his victims or their families. 
Um, so I'll let you read that. And, uh, it's where he belongs. <laughs> so, um, the CERT team, as I said, the CERT team was, uh, was instrumental in this case. It's one that, that they were involved in from the start. It's one of our biggest cases that they were involved in, uh, which is why I'm presenting it here today. Um, uh, they were involved uh, with, any, with all the victims from the beginning. Every time we'd find a new victim, they would, they would get uh, involved with them. Mandy and, uh, and Shelby were, were great with all of our victims. Um, all the way through to the end of trial, and you know, it's not over yet. They're still contacting them on a daily and weekly basis. Um, and they will be there for them right up uh, through the sentencing. They were there for them at trial. They were there for them through all the, uh, the interviews and investigation. And they just did a phenomenal job. So they were instrumental to uh, victim assistance and moving the case forward. Um, sometimes these types of cases, this, this investigation lasted more than a year um, until it went to trial and was successfully prosecuted. Um, but it was reviewed by the SAR team on a monthly basis, and the victims were assisted sometimes on a daily basis um, by our advocates and, and by our uh, counselors. So um, the SAR team was just crucial in the case. So I mentioned that I was your last speaker before lunch, but at the risk of that, uh, if you have any questions for me or my team, um, anything about like that? that we didn't cover, that you may have uh, questions about this case or about the team that we can answer for you. Sure, go ahead. So, <clears throat> so uh, delayed reporting by a decade or more, what kind of bear, uh, obstacles did that present for taking this to a jury with that delayed? I mean, did, did the, was the jury, did, were there any um, witnesses that testified um, about the delayed disclosure? Our expert did cover that and why people delayed uh, in disclosing sexual assault. And so she was able to explain a lot of those things. Um, it really helped, like I said, the, the childhood friends that came forward and said that, that it had happened back then, but they just couldn't bring themselves forward to, uh, to disclose. And so our, our expert witness covered a lot of that. Yes, in the back. Who is your expert witness? Her name is Holly Rosen. I don't know if you heard a little bit. Her, yeah, I have. Let's go back. Can you give me information on her background? I don't have her background in front of me, but she's got about a 15 minute uh, presentation on her background. Um, and Roy Grant has all of that, I think, on her, on her expert. Jason, I can say a little something about that. Sure. Um, She's been working with Michigan State University's Shelter House programming with domestic violence and sexual assault victims for 30 years. So, and juries love her because she educates them about what we do. We know what we do, but when it comes to juries hearing about delayed disclosure, sexual abuse, domestic violence, they, a lot of people just don't get it. So when she comes in, they just, they love her. And juries love nurses too. And she's, she's been qualified as an expert in, I think, at least six different courts and about four times in federal court. Anyone else? 